So first of all, I want to say uh, that it's uh, very moving for me to have the privilege of speaking, being part of this event, and to add my voice to those astonishing and uh, beautiful tributes that we just heard. Um, wonderful, who I guess, Mickey and your staff, you must have put it together. It was a real uh, triumph. Um, I could say a lot more about Phyllis. Uh, he was a dear friend, as is Koichi. Uh, let me just say that um, of all the people I know, not only is Phyllis one of my favorite people, but she's perhaps the only person I've ever met whom I could call Sarvagnya. She's omniscient. And whenever I have some unanswerable question, I will turn to Phyllis and usually uh, I'll get an answer. Sometimes it comes along with a kind of modest disclaimer. Like um, not so long ago, I asked her about some Central Asian text on Maitreya, and she answered the question beautifully. And then she said, you know, I have to tell you that my Cotonese and Toharian are a little rusty. Um, that's a kind of characteristic uh, response of Phyllis's. And I, um, I just want to say that it's a tremendous uh, honor and privilege and joy for me to be here today. Um, Phyllis and Koichi, as uh, we've already heard, they pioneered the study of what is being called um, sacred biography, hagiography, autobiography in South Asia and beyond. And so I picked a topic which I felt was going to be appropriate to this theme. I'm going to be talking about an 18th century, early 18th century autobiography um, from Kerala in Malayalam. Um, I'm going to introduce the text with a few words. We're going to read two or three um, excerpts from it. I'll have a few comments to make about it, and then I'll try to put it in a slightly wider perspective, all of this in about 20, 25 minutes, I hope. Uh, so let me describe this, um, this uh, text to you, um, and I'm going to put, um, put it on the screen, uh, parts of it, just one moment. Okay, I hope you can see that. Okay, visible? Yeah? Great. Okay, so this is a, this is a text um, composed by a Nambutri Brahmin uh, called Apatadiri from a very famous village, Paniur, in north central Kerala. Um, it's a unique text in many ways, as you'll see in a few moments. Um, the uh, text itself uh, surfaced by chance uh, in the early 20th century in the records of a district court in Palakkad. Nobody quite knows how it got there. Um, it's been published three times, once in a rather obscure journal called Yoga Kshemam, and then twice by uh, two well-known historians, N. M. N. Sorry, N. M. Nambudri, and uh, more recently by uh, V.V. Haridas of the University of Calicut. I was introduced to this text by um, Dr. Abhilash Malayil, and we're actually planning to write a book about it because in so many ways it encapsulates a moment of very dramatic civilizational change in South India in general and certainly in North Malabar. Um, this is a text that raises all the kinds of questions that any autobiographical text might raise. One wonders, for example, who was the intended audience? And there is a question as to whether this was a kind of organic, a coherent text uh, written in one go, or perhaps it was a slow accumulation of various autobiographical fragments. Um, you'll hear in a moment that it's not only this one text. Actually, we should be speaking about the Adiri corpus, because we have four or five very closely um, interlocking works that comprise the material of this story. Um, uh, we also don't know whether uh, this uh, Brahmin in the village of uh, uh, Paniwar was aware of the autobiographical vogue that passed through most of South Asia in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, we can describe certain lateral 
um, connections, for example, with the historiographical literature, which is called Kerala Olpati, that is the origins of Kerala in Malayalam prose. Um, and so on, if there's time, I'll say a few more words about that in a moment. I'm going to give you a few sentences of background to the text. I should say it's a very colorful, dramatic, actually often melodramatic text filled with a kind of intimate confessional um, tone. Um, the background is as follows. The village of Paniur uh, was involved for many centuries in a feud with another village, the village of Shukapuram or Chovur, a little bit to the south. These are both Nambudri Brahmin villages. And those of you who know Kerala know that a feud of this sort, they were not uncommon. They're called Kuru Malsaram in Malayalam. Um, they tend to be fought out on the battlegrounds uh, or the arena uh, in which what we find are um, attempts to solidify on the one hand or possibly to destroy the right to perform uh, rituals of public Vedic recitation. Uh, what is called Oti generally or Varam if it's a public uh, Vedic recitation in a temple in the presence of the God. Um, so that's the case of our text as well. And there's another element which should be mentioned um, uh, right at the start, which is that, again, as some of you will know, the uh, public recitation of the Veda in Kerala, in Kerala is um, perhaps the political act par excellence. Um, there is nothing so political as Vedic recitation in Kerala and nothing so laden with consequence. And in the present case of this text that is now called the Atmakata, the story of myself, of Adiri, in the present case, um, uh, the political aspect is very closely related to the intervention of the king, the Zamorin king in Calicut. Um, this, um, this king Calicut, the Zamorin state, was the largest of the North Malabar political systems in the 18th century. Um, for some time, several centuries, the Zamorin kings had been ardent supporters of the Paniur faction in this feud, the ongoing feud with Shukapura. But for reasons that I don't want to go into here, geopolitical reasons, in the early 18th century, the Zamorin began to shift his allegiance away from Panayur and to the rival faction of Shukapura. And the Atmakata, this story of myself, begins with a episode, a violent episode, an altercation that took place in the course of a Varam Vedic recitation in one of the villages, in the course of which the Zamorin soldiers uh, physically attacked some of the Paniur Brahmins and then arrested several of them, including um, several members of the author Adiri's own family. Um, this is described in very graphic, uh, as I said earlier, melodramatic terms. And uh, although the, um, the detainees were later released, Adiri um, came to the conclusion that the loss of the patronage of the Zamorin was going to make his life in the village uh, no longer viable. Um, and after some hesitation, um, he decided that the only rational thing for him to do was to renounce the world and to go to Benares to spend the rest of his life worshipping Lord Shiva Vishwanathan in his temple. So he had determined to do this, and he describes the various considerations and the emotional background to the decision, but there were several problems involved. Above all was the fact that he had to tell his wife, whom he loved, and also their 11-year-old daughter, Savitri, uh, by the way, uh, before he uh, actually brought this topic 
uh, forward with his wife, he buried his household gods in a secret place in one of the Kerala temples. And uh, this was the prelude to his leaving altogether for Benares. And when he finally mustered the courage to tell his wife about his decision, um, she said the following. So please look uh, with me at the, um, the first segment and listen to her voice. She wiped her eyes with a cloth and stuttering, she said, what you said, I agree with it all. Then she exploded and spoke even louder than before. Oh my God, you deceived me. I never thought this would happen. Show me what sin I committed. When I was not even 13 years old, I was separated from my mother and father, and I had the fate, yogam, of coming here. Then they died. I didn't feel great pain because I had left them forever. I've been here for 21 years. In all these years, I never heard even a single harsh word from you. Living here with husband and children who are full of punyam, of great merit, gives me great happiness. Is there anybody like me? That's what people say. But now it's all upside down, by paritium. No one in this world has become as sinful as me. And she was crying, Shankara, Shankara, Govinda, Achyuta, Tamburan, my mind is boiling. I am thinking, when will I hear again that sweet voice of my husband? In what future janma will my two eyes see him? And it goes on like this for a while. I want you to notice the kind of vivid, um, almost colloquial style that we hear. Um, this is the voice of his wife speaking. Um, it's a voice that carries conviction, I think, like almost all the voices that Aditi chooses to record. And you can see that uh, she wasn't making life easy for him when he announced this decision. And in addition to that, there were two particular problems. One was this daughter, Savitri, the 11 year old daughter, um, as she says to him, um, pretty soon they're uh, going to have to arrange her marriage and she can't do it without her husband. Uh, and this is um, and this is sort of weighing on her heart. And in addition to that, um, she mentions a contractual ritual offering, Adharam, which um, was meant to be performed 58 years in the future on the uh, anniversary of um, Adiri's father's birth. 58 years. He was, if our calculations are correct, he was 42 years old at the time of this, of this uh, discussion, which would have made him pretty, pretty old when he came, had to come back to the village from Benares for the Adharam. He says to his wife, you know, uh, maybe we'll take care of the marriage then. And she appropriately says, in 58 years, Savitri will be getting ready to move to the world of Yama, the Lord of the Dead. And then she comes up with a possible solution. So let's read the second selection. Says, uh, selection. Here again, Adiri's wife is speaking. She said, I have to say one or two things more. We have gods and temples. It is your dharma to serve them there. But you feel like going to Kashi to worship Vishwanathan. If you feel bhakti for God, you have the same, Maha, the same Maheshvara here in Paniur. They are not different. This Bhagavan is Kashi Vishwanathan. Kashi Vishwanathan is not a sannigrahan, a punitive God. He doesn't punish good people. If you worship Maheshvara in the Varakovil in Paniur, without relinquishing all your Swadharma, all that you want will come to you. So why go to Kashi? If you're not convinced, then at least spend a year doing that. Then we'll think again. Meanwhile, we will be able to think about the Kanyaka Pradhanam, marrying off the daughter. If you live half a month in the temple and half at home, you'll be doing your Swadharma. When I heard this, I, this is the author Adiri speaking, when I heard this, I thought, yes, let it be like that. If I do like that, no one will be in distress. 
other than the lotus feet of Maheshwaran, who is my Grama Devata, my village god, for the next year there is nothing for me. I have more to say, I said to my wife. For now, it's time for bathing. Um, as you can see, uh, Adiri um, has to accept the um, compromise that his wife has suggested. Possibly he accepts it with some relief. Um, there's a theological argument at stake because indeed Lord Shiva Vishwanatha in, in Banaras should be the same Lord Shiva that they have right there in Paniur. So why bother leaving for, Benar for Benares? But um, what Adiri does do, and this is uh, very striking, is that he moves his life into the temple, the northern temple in Paniur, where he adopts an ascetic regimen. Together, he's not alone, he's with his nephew, who is called Narayanan, Punekada Narayanan. That in itself is rather important because as you'll see in a moment, that nephew is the designated heir who is meant to inherit Adiri's fortune. That's, by the way, very unusual among Nambudri Brahmins who are patrilineal. Unlike the standard matrilineal lineages in, uh, in Kerala, but here we have a nephew who is the key figure in this story, as you'll see in a moment. Um, they live in the temple for 11 years. They eat one meal a day, and even that of no nothing better than rice gruel, kanji. And they spend their time in rituals and worship. Every once in a while, Adiri goes home to visit his wife and solve some urgent manner, but for the most part, he lives uh, day and night in the temple. And finally, to his immense good fortune, something happens. So we're reaching the key moment in the center of the autobiography. Let's read it together. In the eleventh year, the God spoke to us, and I achieved release, mukti. How can I describe that vision? One day, not noticing that it was after midnight, we saw a divine body, Swarupam, that we had never seen or known before. I cannot really describe it. I knew that this was my Lord, Tamburan, Lord Shiva from the Northern Shrine. Tremendous happiness filled my heart. I bowed down and said again and again, protect us, Lord Poti, the divine uh, epithet. I was stuttering because I remembered all the difficulties we had been exposed to. I was weeping tears of joy. The Lord spoke. So here is what Lord Shiva said to Adiri. Notice, by the way, that this is not in a dream. This is a waking revelation, late at night. And the God says, Brahman, whatever you want will happen, just as you think of it. There is no need to worry. When you die, you and your wife will arrive in my world because of your devotion. There is also this task. You have to see and worship Vishnu in his form as the boar, Varahamurti. Let me tell you in parentheses that um, as part of that ongoing feud, people from Shukapuram had um, actually um, demoted the boar image of Vishnu from his temple and replaced it with another image. And um, Adiri felt this as a personal insult to his family and to his line and to his ritual practice. So the god tells him, you're going to have to reinstall Vishnu in the Varaha Murti form, and that's going to happen at a particular moment. I'm reading on, there is a time ordained for that worship the Ishvara year of 1758. Your nephew, Narayanan, will be there for that, right? Notice that the god needs that to be confirmed by Adiri. He will get your hereditary right, and his progeny will join your line. He will accomplish whatever he desires. You can visualize everything through awareness, jnanam. Any uncertainty and confusion will go away. But one thing needs to be done now. 
Your wife is worshipping me without thinking of anything or anyone else, only wanting to get the boon of serving her husband. She's the best. Keep worshipping me at home as a householder. That's what I want. You'll get whatever you want. So that's what the God had to say. Now listen to what Adiri says about his reaction. The god disappeared after this vision. It's called an anugnya. Uh, it's an unusual term. It clearly means this particular revelation. Anugnya also means permission. And in, perhaps that meaning is, uh, is significant here because he's allowing Adiri to go back home. In any case, after the vision, Adiri tells us, I stayed in the mandapam with my hands folded in prayer. Was God's appearance a dream? But I was wide awake. Was he testing me? I had this small doubt. Then I woke up Narayanan and told him all these things. He too was filled with devotion. The next day, in that same place, I couldn't decide if God was testing me or not. Would it turn out to be true? Would it be a sin to stay here, disobeying his orders, wondering about this? I had no certainty about what to do. It was an oral message by the god. My heart still burning, I was speaking with Narayanan when the god spoke again and said, It's all true. You have to go home. Have no doubt. I folded my hands and said, Please forgive all the things I was thinking inappropriately. You are my only support. I said this over and over. I put God in my heart and went home. Now, there are a couple of things to say about this short text of the Anugnya revelation. It's the core of the autobiography. Um, how are we doing on time? Another, do I have another 10 minutes, Vicky? 10 minutes, we'll do it, okay. So, um, this Anugnya uh, revelation um, is actually part of a wider series of texts that I mentioned earlier. Um, I didn't tell you that the autobiography of Adiri has a sequel. It's also possible that it was a prequel and written before the autobiography. That sequel, let's call it a sequel, it was written by a family friend called Vella, um, supposedly some years after Adiri was no longer alive. And I want to show you what this Vella has to say about the text that he was using as the basis for his sequel to the autobiography. So here's Vella's introductory discussion of his sources. Meanwhile, that image of Varaha has been reconsecrated and reinstalled in the Paniur village, as the god had asked. Bella says, during the Pratishta installation ceremony, Appam, possibly Adiri's son, told me that he had a copper plate from his house. I told him to bring it here so I could look at it. So Appam came with it to Paniur. The wise people said it was very difficult to see and study it. They showed it to the king. The king said he was not aware of this. One day after this time, I, Vella, tried to read it. With God's grace, I was able to decipher it. And there was another large text, the Grantham, also difficult to grasp. This was because they didn't have Phyllis Grana with them in the village. Otherwise, she would have read it off right off the bat. Um, there is another second text, equally even more difficult to grasp, and there is yet another one. Appam told me that it, the third text, was lost. On another day, Appam came and showed it to me. It had the exact sentences written on the copper plate, but even more difficult to read. I started transcribing it letter by letter. Some of the palm, trees, uh, palm leaves had been ruined. I wrote continuously, listening to the sentences you will find out that it tells of the past, present, and future of Paniur and its God. In that document, everything corresponds to what we had seen, experienced, and done. The installation, the manner of doing it, the effort to get there, the people who made the effort, the effort to serve Bhagavan, the condition of the king. What happened in the past is exactly what we see in the document, and that being the case, the future 
will also be like this. So you can see that um, we're talking about this corpus of interlocking texts. The original foundational moment of which, and perhaps the original textual fragment, was the Anugnya itself inscribed on a copper plate that is um, unfortunately, but perhaps conveniently, no longer there. And also, the copy of that Anugnya, which we just read together, the copy of it on palm leaf has also disappeared. But there was a third text, a longer one, which includes the same text of the Anugnya, and also perhaps all the rest of Adiri's autobiography. And it's that text, the third text, which perhaps became the source of the manuscript that turned up by some lucky chance in the record office of that um, Palcare uh, district court. And the final text, actually not quite the final because there are several peripheral texts, but the final text for the moment was Vela's sequel to the autobiography in which everything that the god predicted including some very uh, fine-grained predictions that Adiri himself added, um, came to pass in that dramatic uh, Ishvara year of 1758. Okay, I want, to, I want to mention just two or three things before I conclude. And you can see that we've just scratched the surface of what is a very unusual text. Why is it so unusual? Unusual to the point of being unique. First of all, I hope you were able to feel something of the um, personal, introspective voice of the author. Um, like the uh, reported conversations with Adiri's wife, uh, Adiri himself speaks to us in a kind of colloquial Malayalam, slightly elevated into prose. Um, and he speaks about his thoughts, his doubts, his hesitations, his agony. Look at how he reacted to the revelation by the God. One might think if the God appears before you, you'd have a feeling of great certainty. But Aditi says in a very believable way, actually he wasn't certain. certain. Maybe he had concocted the whole thing. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe it was some false voice speaking from some place inside of himself. He has to put that doubt to rest before he can act upon it. And the God um, very helpfully comes a second time and tells him, what I said was correct. You should go home and be with your wife. That kind of self-doubt and the whole, um, let's call it the affective penumbra around it, is very characteristic of this text. It connects it with the introspective literature of, a, of what I would want to call a non-metaphysical type that we see everywhere in the South Indian literatures, not only in literature, also in music and in theater, in this period, beginning in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Um, this is a different kind of introspection. I don't have time to um, explain it at any length now. Let me just say that in contrast with what I would like to call metaphysical introspection, which exists in plenty in all of the Indian sources, going back to the classical period in medieval India, metaphysical um, introspection that we find, let us say, in yoga, in Advaita, in the Buddhist sources, and so on, in which the empirical individual and his or her uh, quirks, moods, uh, transient uh, thoughts, and so on, um, are put aside. In contrast with metaphysical introspection, we now have introspection of a highly personal, empirical, this-worldly, laukika type. We have it in the autobiography, we have it in, in related texts, uh, we have it in the literature of the Padam musical compositions, which became dominant at this time, the 18th century. We have it in the Prabandha texts that were composed in all of the major literatures in the South, including Sanskrit and Persian and Oriya and Marathi, in short, all the languages that Phyllis Granoff reads. Um, this is a new kind of voice. And the autobiography is one of its um, very salient um, embodiments. Then there's the question of this, the, um, the organization of this textual corpus. So if you think, as I tried to suggest, 
that the copper plate which contained engraved upon it the words of the God in his revelation to Adiri, if you think that that copper plate revelation is the original text, then we have a situation which is familiar to us from South Indian literature. It's a kind of literary structure um, in which the foundational moment is buried somewhere in the middle of the narrative so that if you begin somewhere in the middle, you, um, you are moving towards that foundational moment step by step and then maybe away from it once you've reached it. Um, there are a lot of examples of that. It's, um, it's an interesting structure in its own right. There's the Kalapo Noriyamu in Telugu, which um, Narayan around I uh, translated as the sound of the kiss. It has exactly that kind of a structure. And we also have the two echo texts of the autobiography of Adiri himself and then this sequel or was it a prequel composed by Bella? So let me say just a word about that. Um, there's a sense in which the Adiri autobiography belongs to the, gen the genre called Kalagnanam. It's a prevalent South Indian historiographical genre in which history is told in the future tense. We have quite a few examples of that. Um, we've written about it, Narayan Rao and I, uh, Philip Wagner has written about it in the, uh, in the context of a particular Telugu history. Um, this text is partly a Kalagnanam text told in the future tense as a prediction. So that we have a kind of astral time. There's reason to think that Adiri himself was an astrologer, a village Jyotisha, using the style of the village astrologer. And we have a text which is at once prospective and retrospective. This may be a diagnostic feature of the Malayalam um, autobiographical genre. I've already mentioned that there's a connection to the historiog uh, historiographical style of the Kerala Olpati. Um, and uh, if there were time, uh, obviously there's quite a lot more I would be happy to tell you about this textual corpus. Let me just um, conclude by saying that we have here um, a work with distinctive features of its own, part of a wider movement of autobiography, um, the work of a singular, introspective, maverick individual giving an honest, intimate report of what goes on in his mind in a way that we, reading this text some centuries later, can see that it encapsulates the nature of the radical civilizational change that was taking place in North Malabar as in all the rest of South India. There's a doubt that I'm left with as I end this talk. Um, is this a sacred biography or autobiography? Um, I guess I'll have to leave it to you to make up your own minds about that. Thank you very much. And again, my felicitations and blessings and namaskars and salams to Phyllis Granoff, my dear friend.